Happy Halloween. It's an absurd holiday. Oh, yes. Putting on costumes and striking fear. Quite absurd. Gotham's wealth, its spirit, but your feast is nearly over. This is the blood hole. It's an operating table. And I'm the surgeon. Why aren't you laughing? From this moment on, none of you are safe. Welcome to the Batman Book Club, a podcast exploring the Dark Knight Library. I am your host, Ryan Lauer. The Batman Book Club is a proud member of the Batman Podcast Network, hosted by Batman on Film. Just go to batmanonfilm.com, click on podcasts, and you'll find the Batman Podcast Network that has a whole list of other Bat-related shows that also like to dive into other nerdy subjects that we all, every single one of us, including Peter Vera, love to frolic about in our free time. There's a lot of frolicking this time of year as well. Um Batman Book Club is also on Patreon. If you like to show on a sports show and join the others who have become patrons, um, just go to patreon.com slash the Batman BC. Now, we're moving right along in the uh, spooky month, um, a highly coveted month um, around these here parts. Um, this is episode 169 already, but I mean, this is a spooky month episode number two. Skeeter! Got to have the exclamation point at the end. Um, and when I think spooky month, I think of uh, horror. And when I think of horror, I think of my guest. He is a, a horror guru. He loves uh, everything about the genre. It's uh, fellow Midwestern Garrett Grev. Hello, Garrett. Of course. Of course, that's that's what I'm largely known for. Yeah. I really like uh, body horror. Yeah. Um, the more graphic and gory, the better for me. I yep. want to. I can't even I, I can't even keep up. I, I I can't maintain the farce. It's just so far from the truth. You know, yeah. I like um here here's where I start getting like tapped out. We've talked about this on a bunch of other shows before. One, thank you for having me, Ryan. It's always, always. a pleasure to be on the show, particular honor to be a part of Spooky Month. Yeah. Um, you know, the Lost Boys, the yes. Joel Schumacher movie. Um, there's a scene where there's like a bunch of partying saxophone. Teams. Oh, wait. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. That's where everybody's <laughs> mind goes. Uh -huh. But they're like, they're like partying around a bonfire and uh, the vampires attack. And there's like a couple particularly gruesome bites. And that's not known. People don't think of that as like a gore fest movie. Actually, sure. it's like, I think outside of maybe a little Kinda language, they, they could have gotten away without the R rating in there. It's a lot that you don't see, but there's a couple things you do see. That's, that's about good for old Garrett, you know? A, it, yeah. It just it's uh it's a no thank you for the most part. I like the sixth sense. Is that a horror movie? There's no gore in that sure. one, really. I mean, Bruce Willis gets shot. Uh I'll say no more uh, about <laughs> you know, case, case 20, 24 years later. You haven't seen that one. Check it yeah. out, Haley Joe. You know, it's uh you will not see that ending coming. Oh no, boy, oh boy, you sure won't. But um, I did realize as we were getting ready for this, I've got a uh it's been a little while since I've been on the show, yep. but I feel like I've had a tendency on some of these episodes to come in and uh, bring a little Superman with me. So yes. the next time I'm on the show, Ryan, I'm going to give you a no Superman guarantee. It'll just be Batman, you know, no other heroes involved outside the Bat family. I'll give you that commitment because I, I know you've got one rule. You know, you like, know my rule. And I don't want you to have to break it tonight. I'm not your joker, even though I am wearing purple today. You don't have to worry about that because what you have chosen, I mean, was Batman not crucial in Kingdom Come? Absolutely. Absolutely. Was Batman not crucial in One Night in Gotham? Absolutely. Absolutely. He was crucial. Uh, so the story we're about to get to, is Batman not crucial to the story? <laughs> so you you're know, on a roll, my friend. Don't put that much pressure on yourself. I'll tell you what. You know, you already said we're talking about Skeeter! Exclamation uh, point excuse included. me. Do you, do you want to try that again? You what's Skeeter? Yes, there we go. Skeeter, right. and we're not talking about Doug. No, not yeah. that Skeeter. Oh, man. We're talking if about we Skeeter. Could, 
if there is a <laughs> quail man slash batman crossover book out there i call dibs um okay, done <laughs> it is yeah, the skater uh and it's from action comics annual number one so it's a batman title but i would i think batman's actually more prominent in this story than superman yeah. himself and i've talked about this before i've talked about it with you i've talked about it on the batman on film podcast um you know, I don't think John Byrne gets enough love for his Batman work because there just wasn't nearly as much of it. You know, I think yeah. uh, post crisis, you know, Byrne showed that he wanted to, you know, dabble in Batman a little bit. And then there's the generation storyline where Batman and Superman are, are co-starring in that. But I just really think he does a nice job with Bat content. And when I was reading this uh, earlier this year, I think it was towards the beginning of the year, just in my own free time it's mm-hmm. what i jotted down and said you know talk to lauer this is a good spooky month one this is this is we got some supernatural uh, a lot of supernatural we got some batman and you know i'll talk about it as we go along i think it's just a really well crafted comic book story good crafted story yeah uh let's do some some quick behind the uh some history behind sure. action comics annual number one skater uh written by john byrne so I actually think what last time that you were on. So when I asked you about for spooky month, uh, you mentioned this issue and it sounded familiar to me only in the sense of like, oh, I think you and I talked about this and how you'd mentioned before of this would be a good one. And then I, you know, and then I was like, well, of course, it's John Byrne um, <laughs> Superman. Yeah. So, of course, here it's going to milk as much as you can with uh, with this stuff. But it's also very fitting. Art is by Arthur Adams. It was released physically in 1987. He post crisis world. Um Digitally is something else. The issue on its own, I tried to look on DC Universe Infinite and just the issue on its own, I couldn't find digitally on Comicsology. I couldn't find it digitally on its own, but there are some collections that it's in. Oh, and very those nice. are available on DC Universe Infinite Ultra. Uh, as I was well going to say, as... maybe you had to go to the Plus Ultra yep. Prime yeah. version. The upper tier. So... The Beast has been, let's see, Superman. So this was thanks to, I I knew, I did some research on it, um, that DC fandom website um, does a really good job of saying what issues show up in collections. Um, sure. I have the the one tr- trade. I knew it was in Superman Man of Steel Volume 6 The uh, um, from like over a decade ago. Yeah, Those the paperback releases. Yeah, yeah, had some great papers, smelled delicious. Yeah. Um, it was also in, and I do have this trade, Superman Dark Knight over Metropolis. And then also the recently released collections of the John Burns Man of Steel Volume Three, and those, the I don't think I don't know if the Dark Knight over Metropolis is available, but the Superman Man of Steel and then just the Man of Steel, those are available on my favorite app of all time, Hoopla. And those collections are on Comicsology. They're also, like I said, DC Universe and Finite. So uh, for this here episode discussion, Garrett, which version did you read? I'm guessing you could answer it for me. I've been singing these collections praises for almost yes. two years now, since they first started coming out. The yeah. Superman, Man of Steel, Burn era, uh, hardcover collections, four volumes that have been released since starting in, in 2021 are just absolutely gorgeous. They're, they're some of my prized possessions in mm-hmm. my, uh, in my library uh, where I keep my, you know, trades and hardcovers, not the, the floppies are upstairs and in, in long boxes. Um, in my closet because you know, can't have those all over the house. I got too many kids for that. Yeah. And I absolutely adore these collections. So you're right. It is in volume three. It's actually the lead off issue that's collected in volume three. So you get, you know, you get for a bat fan like me, you know, mm-hmm. I say it like, it's like picking between my favorite kids. You kind of have one, but you don't really like for me to be able to read a Superman collection and have Batman who is, mm-hmm. you know, kind of typically my one, a to my one B soups. Um, it's a great lead off run. You know, it's great. I had a variation of that in that I checked out that same volume, but through Hoopla. So sure. I went I went all As digital on this. As you and are though, known to do. Yeah, you sing the praises of these hardcovers. And um, I'm re- I remember even texting you. I was very close to buying or bidding on this great um, bundle on eBay of them. And then I just uh, talked myself out of it because I was being like responsible or something stupid like that. Um, you know, I, ne- I never pulled the trigger. I'm a big fan of fiscal responsibility. I'm also yeah. a big fan of of Burn Era Superman and these collections in particular. So you really can't go wrong with that decision. If any listeners are out there 
Um, these things were priced at a premium. And because uh, I'm an impatient sort, I bought them pretty early, but I, I think a mix between uh, eBay, Amazon, and in-stock trades was able to get a pretty good discount on each of them. The prices yeah. have come down on some of the individual collections. The lot of all four, though, sells on eBay for as expensive as it's ever been. So if you're mm -hmm. looking to grab all four, um, I'd maybe recommend piecing them together and saving yourself a little bit of cash. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the the fiscal corner of the Batman book club. <laughs> yeah, there's right there. your, your, your we'll financial help you spend minute. your money. <laughs> <laughs> right. We'll help you spend your money. Do you remember, Garrett, when you first read this story? It actually was not on my radar until I got this collection. Um, you know, when I was a youngster, I was grabbing, it was basically my dad when he was on the road would grab individual issues. And if he had been on a couple day road trip or something would bring me yeah. back a comic or if he just happened to be filling up gas and was, you know, maybe I'd cleaned my room recently or something like that would grab me individual issues. Good job, he son. Here's a comic book. Right. He actually, <laughs> um, so he uh, was in sales and maintenance for office equipment for years and years and years. And one of his clients um, was a bookstore. And back in the day, they just used to send back the covers off comics. I don't know if this is shady dealings or not, but they'd rip oh. the covers off and return just the covers to the publishers and they'd keep the pages. And every once in a while, when he would visit them, they'd give him a whole stack of comic books without any covers on it. And I'd you know, oh, thumb through those. I was just reading them, right? I think I sure. tore out pages and hung them up in my room when I was little and stuff like that. So I don't have any of those uh, that have made it through the years, unfortunately. And I just don't think, you know, annuals weren't something that I that I bought typically, even if yeah. I had, you know, whatever, a, a buck and a quarter, or whatever is probably less than that, even I should know um, at the time. So missed this forever and first saw it. I think I had heard of the story or seen it talked about, but I hadn't read it for myself until just this this past year when I said, hey, Laura, I want to mm -hmm. talk about it. Yeah, let's do it. And much like I said with hoss on the last episode if it's something i haven't read before i really try to wait until i get close to recording time and rec and read it so that i can still have that almost like that that high of like oh it's fresh first time yeah. read i'm bringing to this like brand new eyes and stuff and hopefully in a case like this when it is just one issue i have enough time i can go back and read it again um this i actually read specifically for the first time for this episode and then i did get to go back and read it a second time before we sat down to record so this is fresh to me um, I'll want to so ask you so clean. once we get into, you know, a little bit of the initial discussion, just so we don't, you know, yeah. bust it wide open right away, how the second reading went for you compared to the first. Cause I, I okay. thought that was a fun experience. Um, yeah, make sure to bring that up. And then, I mean, as always, especially with spooky month, it kind of answers itself, but I'm not going to answer it for you of why annual action comics, annual number one, also known as skater. Well, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> Um, there's some, some big titles, some heavy hitters, you know, collected editions, storylines that are known, you know, Batman's known to interact with the supernatural, but it's not the most commonplace thing in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, typically if I encounter one and it hasn't been discussed either through your regular, uh, programming or through spooky month, which is what year three is spooky month now Four, four, year four. four. Wow. What yeah. a tradition. God bless you, Ryan Lauer. Just bringing the <laughs> goodness you say, to you the say to me before, even like last night, like it must protect spooky month at all costs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spooky month, spooky month must be protected. Um, so, you know, f four years and uh, just hundreds of regular episodes, you've yeah. covered some of the big storylines where Batman's interacting with the supernatural. Um, so if I find one that, you know, I think is maybe new to me, obviously, or underrepresented out there, isn't as well known, I like to shine the little bat signal on it and yeah. make sure it's lit up in the sky so people can find it. It's serving. I mean, I also said this to Haas on last issue as well of it, it's serving, of course, the the hits are the hits for a reason. Love covering right. the hits. But the point of the Batman Book Club, it works both ways of the guest. And then for me, too, is to go di like dive a little deeper unexplored territory and so then it yeah. becomes thankful because last issue of the fir like first time i ever read that and that was that was great this episode this issue first time i read it spoiler alert i really liked it so it's like another fun great read for this time of year like you know another annual read of some sort or whatever i know that um i can check out you know i can cross streams and hit up some superman 
and uh there's enough batman in there and there's some horror in there and then also for this time of month too vampires slash dracula with batman seem to just like it works that's not well, too crazy it, it and that's a that's a key <laughs> plot point of this story when we get into it so yeah get the vampires in there for sure and the thematically mesh as well with batman and i love it for mm-hmm. the listeners too because you know there's some like you said, the hits are the hits for the reason. And most people know the hits. Uh, they're familiar with them if they haven't read them all uh, themselves. It's always nice to be able to present the listeners with a with a deeper pull uh, yep. that maybe you, know, you enjoyed. You'd like them to enjoy. And let's keep getting good, uh, good comics, more publicity. Yeah. And especially something like this, that on its own, it's hard to find on its own, but it's in these different collections. So it's like, oh, you've got this sort of a diamond in the rough. You know, we just need to help you show which spot do you dig. Right. Um, Absolutely. And we're helping. It. So, yeah, that's what we do, do. Just for the we're people. Helpers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for the people. For uh, the people. Uh, the people. So this story is, yes, it's labeled as a Superman story. I think it's. So you even said upon a second reading, my first impression, first read of it was, oh, wow, this feels like a Batman story. Right. Upon second reading. I, I see it's pretty balanced, I think. It's it's definitely a it's like it's a world's finest issue. I think there's equal time for both. You also get a snapshot in Metropolis and a snapshot in Gotham, but otherwise you're in Fayetteville, South Carolina. Um, and I think they both equally have something to do, and they both discover what's going on in different ways and right. different parts of the overall picture too. So I think just from a writer's standpoint, a story standpoint, I think Burn surprise. Did a really gosh darn good job. You know, wow, that guy knows. <laughs> turns out John Byrne knows how to write a comic book. Wow. Yeah. You know? <laughs> how about them apples? Wow. Especially, um, especially in his, what I would argue to be his real prime in, in, in the late 80s and early yeah. 90s. Like I was firing all, on all cylinders to say, you know, nothing of his artwork, but which he is not featured here. Uh, Art Adams no. does a fantastic job in this, um, you know, very moody, mm-hmm. very interesting and some unique, um, some unique design work and how he presents the characters that doesn't quite mesh what was going on in the main titles at the time. Not that this, I mean, this is obviously an action, but yet you know, annual is a one-off sort of a guest spot art um, gig for, for Adams um, feels pretty fresh. I mean, not, not so fresh that it's disconnected to the, what was the general portrayal of the characters, um, but just a little bit of a different style. I think a lot of, you know, comic book readers are familiar uh, with Adams from the X-Men world, whether it was the long shot miniseries, maxi series. I can't remember how long that one went for um, associated and did some work in Uncanny um, and then uh, was on you know, New Mutant stuff. but really was well known for Wolverine for a long time. So to see him on-, on DC and in a little bit of a different stylistic approach to the big two at DC is, is fun. The to comment on his art so the number one indicator for me of 80s era is how we open up on i almost want to say ellie may clamp it Um, right yeah (laughs) but the hair yes there is a thing of 80s hair yeah in real life but then also it's drawn there's so many lines in the big poofy ish kind of hair that there's just something with that hair that is just screams like 80s and i love 80s comic books as it is anyway but there's like a style with the hair big bushy uh lines and everything that's like that's great but then the whole setting throughout and throughout the whole thing feels very um 80s that i like and then with the story and this is also i didn't know that i wrote down notes for the after the first like i got some notes after the first read and then on the second one i was like oh i need to make sure to put this down and i already did that this feels like an opening to like a tales from the crypt episode yeah totally you know and I love and that. Tales from the Crypt w- was also had a little bit of the, you know, cheesecake, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, let's call it like it is just get, you know, sexy female, you know, yep. intrigue to pull you in. And right, this is this? definitely an 80s comic, uh, not Ellie Mae, uh, but but Skeeter. Um, yeah. Yep. She's <laughs> she's 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 drawn to be very eye catching. Right. It, yep. And like you. Also young and cute, but also very eye catching as um, typically is represented in comic books. <laughs> a lot of teenage girls seem like a lot of uh, like supermodel, fully grown women in, yeah, in a lot of exactly. comic book illustrations. Um, so, yeah, and I mean, the story and starting off with like 
you know, you've got the village mob with the pitch, you know, the flames chasing after a girl in a swamp. And then this great little revelation of she goes talking to uh, Mammy and Pa. <laughs> right. I I love I love that Byrne went to the the great lengths throughout the whole thing of like, no, we're going to do South Carolina. Yeah. Uh, English. And even with education, like, like that was the big one that stuck out for me of even how education. Edu- Shun. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, Burn the, the so Brit uh, who came to the United States via Canada, right? And, yeah. and he's writing in his best <laughs> Southern drawl. Yeah, that's now, it. Now, all let the, me ask uh, you all this. Okay. <clears throat> so right away, Laura, let me ask you something here. Yeah. First reading. Yes. Did this feel like an angry village person mobbed you? Or did you think it was a supernatural element to begin with? I well or a cult, right? N- Some sort of not all as it seemed because of the cover. It said cry vampire. And it's like, okay, so there's vampires. Sure. Um so I, I don't exactly know because in reading it was okay, is the twist in the end like we need to be on her side and they're bad? Or there's more than meets the eye with her and they're actually good. And then it shows that she's talking to two corpses. I'm like, all right, something something ain't right. Um so I'll still, say you might I, you might have been in on it a little bit cl- closer to off the jump than me. Because when okay. I read it for the first time, I thought these were like either members of a vampire cult or under the control of a vampire. And she, she was the victim that they were chasing down either to bring back to their master or, you know, some sort of weird sacrifice or whatever else. Well, that's what I thought too. When she said that when there was an emphasis on it's almost dawn. Yeah. And she can hide. She has to get away from them before dawn, right? If she can just wait until dawn, that is. Yeah. She can just wait till dawn. And, but I mean, I felt like it was a little more like, well, is it because they have to go during the daytime or she gets to hide in the daytime? And I always thought, well, if a vampire is looking to hide then well, then normal people can go find them and kill vampires while they're sleeping. So it, I lean through all my vampire knowledge and media. I have your many studies. I think I leaned more towards like, Oh, okay. The mob, there's something up with them more than her. And then you have that nice little like, Oh, she's talking to Mammy and Pa who are corpses. Okay. Well, huh? I don't know where I lean. And then it brings it to not matches Malone, Mr. Smith. Yeah. Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith comes to town. And at this point, um, I thought Mr. Smith was Clark in a disguise the first time. So did I. So did I. That Uh, jaw. Yeah. That jaw. On both of them. them, But those jaws, my goodness. Art Adams, um, his Bruce Wayne looks a lot like Clark would look if you slapped a mustache on Clark. Yep. So I, I and I don't know if that was intent because my read of this story, we might as well just kind of get into it. Yep. Um, there, there is intent, intentional either vagueness or deception that plays throughout the structure of this book. Agreed. And I wondered to myself if that choice by Adams was intentional to make us wonder, all right, what hero's getting here first? Who's who's doing the work? Is this undercover investigative reporter, Clark Kent, or is it uh Bruce Wayne? You know, and we don't always see you know, like Bruce Wayne just out and about in a disguise and other locations outside of Gotham. We're used to matches going down and doing this thing, you know, <clears throat> street level, you know, the drifter yeah. look, right, or whatever else. Um so I wasn't sure. And it wasn't until, you know, maybe this the second page in that I'm like, oh yeah, this is Bruce. Okay, cool. And that and then round the long for the ride. By the way, just to touch back on the on Ma and Pa, the corpses, I thought in my first reading, the way out that way things were going, her parents had been victims of this vampire cult mm. or these 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 people under control of whatever dark powers had drained them of their life force and yeah. left her two parents that were corpses and she was having a hard time reconciling. Interesting. Um, I don't know that I had a thought. I was just really happy to see that Mammy had 80s hair, even though we come to find out she died centuries ago. <laughs> Right, <laughs> century ago. Yeah, yeah. She was she was way ahead of the curve. Even though she Pa was, Pa had eighteen hundreds hair, she Mammy. was alive during the Lincoln administration. But yep. uh, you know, Good hey, for her, yeah, she was ahead of her time. She was a fashion icon. You know, just pushing the leading envelope of style. Yep. 
I think uh, to emphasize on the Tales from the Crypt episode, but then also of its time of 80s horror is, you know, the uh, the outsider coming into the diner where it seems right. a little all eyes on him. Like, oh, you're from out of town. But at least the waitress was friendly. But then you had an unfriendly guy that Angie all got dish you'd be picking up, you know, because that's how. Even though he he looks like he's out of the fifties with that, yeah, he's like um, a fifties greaser pearl. with a pompadour. It looks like he's got a whole bunch <laughs> of pomade in there. Underneath his jacket, he's got a packet of cigarettes. Yeah, rolled, rolled up, up in his, his sleeve. sleeve. Yep. For sure good, he does. For sure things. he does. We do find out that that's Batman, and the woman he helped into town, um, her throat had been ripped out and drained of blood. Okay, oh so we're we're diving more into this, um into this vampire theme and i'm not going to go through like all like every beat of the entire like issue but it's like that's the setup and at this point too and i'm looking like even this and he he escapes the mob and i'm like oh man we're at page 14 of this issue and there's no superman and that's why i thought after that first one of like i know the cover is action comics annual and i was like oh wow we're really far into this because at this point too i didn't know that this was a longer issue either and right. I'm like we're this is supposed to be like 22, 23 pages. We're, on we're page running 14. out of pages there's, here. There's no Superman yet. Interesting. Um, and then yeah, and then you go to that next page. And Garrett, I I find me being the Batman to your Superman, and that in calling you or texting you, if there ever is like on your end of like, well, prove to me that you're Lauer, that I would just say one word, magpie. Magpie. And yeah. you know, <laughs> you yeah. know, you're like, okay, it's really him. It's great. Love that touch of Magpie because when you were on the last time, we even got to talk about good old fishnet stockings Magpie. Sure did. Good for sure her. Did God you bless know, her. You know, Magpie is uh, just a gem, right? I think it's really, it really is. There was um, oh my gosh, by, what story was it that it was in World's Finest, uh, the yeah. the new series World's yeah. Finest that they chased down Magpie and doggone it, they made sure to go with her full-on crazy yeah. hairstyle fish yep. stuff because they did the original look and i said thank yeah, you there Mark was Wade. no update we're not trying to make a gen z magpie here this this is this is gen no. x magpie right yeah magpie born and raised 1986 by the way interesting detail here the way adams draws batman um one i already mentioned bulk here uh there's there's a scene on page 12 when he's leaping off of a rooftop very dark night returns inspired thank you. absolutely yeah. Yep, you can almost see the lightning flash behind him. Um, but also, uh, very clearly, this Batman does not have white lenses. He has eye holes in the mask, and his eyes are you know drawn to be white. You know whether that's the reflection or just not you know having the time to to put the hyper detailed pupils in. But it's very clearly holes in the mask for with the eyes flesh tone, and then the eyes inset within the holes of the mask. I thought that's yeah. an inter- that was an interesting choice. Yeah, because at first I thought maybe it was like a coloring thing, but then you see when there's enough close-ups of like, oh no, 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 it's very yeah, it's a repeating thing. I had the same thought. Uh, was this just a mix in the coloring? But nope, it's intentional. Uh, I think it's interesting. I won't say that I love it, but I definitely no. don't hate it. It's just uh, I, I'm middle of the road with it. I'm like, okay, interesting choice. And then how much is used of like really act like uh, throwing the blue? So like that Dark Knight Return shot that you just mentioned, very blue. Um, bat suit and then you go to the very next page and it's very much the black with like blue you'd almost feel like the certain points of the light hitting is like a darker blue feels very animated series kind of coloring Um, yes superman similarly throughout the issue kind of goes back and i think it's um i'm not sure how consistent it is i'm i'm assuming it's meant just to show the the light in the scene that they're in but superman goes to almost a navy uh, looking suit on a couple pages as well 32 pops out where it's 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 more of a deep navy colored superman mm-hmm. suit as opposed to the you know more traditional lighter blue um, speaking of dark knight returns i mean i think i felt i got some vibes there for superman portrayal as well especially oh, like yeah. when we when he first suits up and it, i mean the all the blue is black and he's in silhouette but that red and yellow um symbol on his chest and then the red cape shine as he bolts out the window and then back to like his massive jaw it makes me think of that you know 
fourth issue of Dark Knight Returns right. Superman and everything. I'm like, okay, well, this is definitely got to be like influenced um, by yeah, that. Yeah, Art sure, Adams actually said them. later that, okay. that his approach to drawing these two, he was drawing on, he was drawing from the Dark Knight Returns a bit for inspiration um, in how he was drawing these two characters. So, I, you know, that, that, uh, those panels you're talking about with Superman draped in silhouette and just the shield and the cape and the belt are visible. Um, also is, I think, a really interesting, introduces on the same page, an interesting part of the storyline where Skeeter meets Batman yep. and, uh, acts as if she's been expecting him. Like, oh, you came. You know, they said someone would come to help me and you're here. And Batman, you know, remarks that, man, she's not even a little bit afraid of me. And she, she gives him a big hug. Uh, said, I've been waiting for you. They said you'd come maybe someday soon or m- maybe someday soon as, yeah. as Burton writes it up and says she isn't even afraid a little bit, which was um, interesting. And I think smart as the story continues to unfold. So big revelation here. And this is what I mean of uh, discovering what's going on and how Superman and Batman both have different uh, paths. And Batman's is smaller in scale in the sense of he's dealing with Skater. Superman goes to the sheriff and then finds out of basically this, basically uh, vampires, victims, which I think it's great of when he opens up that door, we see him and then we see his reaction, but we don't see what he sees. Right. Uh, sm- it's a, that's a good, I think it's a good choice. Yeah, um, where the, where the victims have been held, Superman is. Is, is shocked and appalled to see what the town has had to deal with or what the law enforcement, of course, in classical soups, you know, mode, he's like, my first thing is I should check in with the local law enforcement because I'm yeah, a rule follower and that'd be the right <laughs> way to operate in this town. And Batman's hey, like, I'm going to sneak my way in, in yeah. a disguise <laughs> and then, and then utilize the shadows to, you know, creep around and figure out what's going on here. It's just good character That's work. That's right. And Batman took, you know, he was like in a heroic approach. He didn't beat the hell out of all the people coming after him. He basically smoke bombed them and then disappeared. Right. So good on and, him. And then told himself, ah, oh, I feel like a coward almost, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Let's bring in Superman here. And then, so with Skeeter's revelation, when Batman sees Mammy and Pa and he says, good Lord, and that makes her flip. Uh, this is great. I thought this was just great. Makes her flip what you said. You said, and she couldn't shake it. You said the name. How could you say the, the holy name? name? You can't do that, right? And now she sees him much like differently, and she turns villainous now. Well, so, and this is the key thing, right? We already we said, and we talk about it, you know, fairly often. How Batman and vampires are kind of like peanut butter and jelly; they just match up really well, yeah. thematically tied close to one another with the bat motif. And we find out, first of all, before we find out what we find out, the way that the story kind of ping pongs between Batman's experience and the story unfolding in front of him and Superman's experience separate in the way the story is unfolding in front of him. But that drives the narrative from two different directions towards the sort of resolution and the action part of the comic book. I think it's just really well crafted. I think the the, the sort of I'm going to focus on these two characters exploring and learning about what the heck's actually going on here, both serving as this vantage point for the comic book reader, because this town exists on its own. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with the stuff they're dealing with separate from the action of this comic book. The comic book is what brings both Batman and Superman, but us as the reader into the goings on of this vampire infested or under attack town. So utilizing them both, separately to get to the same point before you really start driving more of the action was was just super smart and you know what we find out is skeeter thinks batman some kind of super vampire that has shown up to rescue her because he looks like a bat and when he is able to say the word lord or holy lord or whatever he says um and she's like uh or good lord and she's like you said the holy name now the gig's up she knows he can't possibly be a vampire he can't possibly be the person that's come to save her who is, you know, fully revealed to be the vampire at the heart of the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then and tries I, and, to like mind attack Batman. And to intercut that. So they're intercutting that revelation to Superman's discovery of all the uh, victims. And then, I mean, Batman's escape, but this is what I mean. If it's not Superman comes in and then fights her and, you know, it's not, 
one sort of overtaking the other one's plot you know superman then becomes of i'm not gonna kill all these others but it's like trying to figure out how to save them and which i think is done in a very superman way um because i mean he even recognizes as well of i haven't seen anyone turn into a bat or a wolf or a mist they're not even hurting anyone just threatening but they are doing a lot of physical damage yeah they're taking down the town but uh what they you know what they mention is these aren't victims of the vampire who have been killed so they're under the power of the vampire they do the vampire's bidding but they have not yet been turned into undead creatures yeah that i'm fairly certain superman would have no no moral qualm about putting down an already dead supernatural creature but you know he's a goody goody but so is batman and we see where that goes later in the story yeah what we do get so superman swirling around basically creates almost like a little prison for these vampires as a debris wall um crazy haired evil skeeter oh yeah um, she's bring, going brings full in the unload. bats right. brings in the bats and i still love that she doesn't go into some ul- ultimate villain gear she continues her cut off jeans and mr peanut shirt because why <laughs> why not yeah, the fangs, vampire. <laughs> the fangs pop out the claws get big very lost boys too right like when yeah. the in the lost boys when you know those teens turned into vampires they're still wearing their super rad 80s leather jackets and stuff they just had some accentuated features and, and ears and fangs and all all of that fun stuff so i thought it was a good a good depiction as well i think it's drawn really well the confrontation of skeeter and uh superman of the first shot of her steer like standing very much like badass and then her face is in shadow but her glowing eyes um i think that's cool but then i mean you just said about how superman is i mean he gets scratched which surprises him but then let's see generally i make it a point to avoid punching out the ladies but then you're no lady are you classic soups <laughs> absolutely absolutely I'll take and, out and a vampire another thing that kind of points this very clearly in the post-crisis run is they used to make a really big deal about this sort of aura that surrounded superman it was one of the reasons they got away from having to explain why his suit while being made by by ma kent um doesn't get damaged it was no longer a kryptonian blanket or cloth that was found in the ship um ma just made it and the reason it was so form-fitting and never got damaged is because it was very close to superman's body who had the like special kryptonian aura around it that protected it skeeter can scratch right through that you know uh, slices up the s shield pretty good and hurts superman later batman's like i'd I'd wash those cuts out yeah do it with some holy water if you can right check that out uh their soups i like that there is a great payoff with her if she doesn't go full-on vampire look you know ears fangs elongated mouth and everything until the end that's a great save that for the end we don't need to escalating yeah see it all exactly and and i think that complements your point early on of how you said of the elements of a well-told story of it is a constantly moving forward and a constantly building story to what i think is a a genuine climax absolutely and i think it also helps um you know page 37 you, you see the demise of old skeeter here yeah and um it comes at the end of a sharp wooden long stake with batman yeah. and if you're gonna have batman um quote unquote kill you need to make sure that character is very clearly already dead so that the moral <laughs> yeah. code remains intact right you so if skeeter's been dead for hundreds of years uh mm-hmm. then there's really no issue uh with batman um ending her uh undead life it doesn't make a lot of sense but it does it does it makes sense in particular at the transition yeah. of, of, of her going full vampire at the climax it's like okay yeah, batman killed an undead thing uh he just made it actually dead instead of undead but it was already dead anyway basically set her free that means in her favor <laughs> he did oh, god bless him he's the what best a guy what a guy that batman i think that the, burn does a good job of displaying the strengths of the two um like in literal sense, but also in thinking about it where Batman recognizes he's kind of becoming under her. Well, both of them, especially Batman feels like the cold, the coldness when she presents herself, but then he starts to feel like my will is kind of like leaving. I got to get out of here. And he jumps out of that room into the quote quicksand in which she thinks that he's dead. Um, Superman, when he's fighting her in which 
Um, Adams does a great job of illustrating this as well as we get closer and like just the detail in her in the horrible face that she has. Right. But I mean, he says too, like my will, my will is, and you can realize he's just, cause it's kind of, it is, it's like Superman. How are you not taking out this vampire? But it's like yeah. the power of a vampire though. Feels like she's stirring my brain with an ice pick, yeah. um, which yeah, also makes this a good story to combine these two characters because you know, you don't have to do a bunch of um, plot logic to explain why, you know, Batman would need Superman's help or why Superman would need Batman's help um, because Batman's vulnerable to magic and the supernatural. So mm-hmm. pairing up on a smaller scale story, these two characters, it's like, well, what are you going to have him do? Like, what does Batman need Superman there for? I, of course, we know uh, that, you know, Batman can always use Superman, Batman or Superman can always use Batman, I should say. And he um, did need Batman here. Absolutely. He was about down for That's the That's why this Batman's important to the story. Otherwise, Superman would have died. Yeah. We would Superman never would have no, become no a Superman super comics. vampire is what would have happened. Now, that'd be kind of cool. That would be kind of cool. Maybe there's an Elseworlds tale just yeah. brewing. Waiting. Let's, hurt, what let's if, hurry up and TM. T- yeah. <laughs> what yeah. if it, Superman was Like a if vampire? Marvel was, uh, was, was doing the story. What if Skeeter would have turned Superman? <laughs> I do cringe in all of my horror watching when there is like a stake through a chest. Oh, sure. It feels very, I mean, it's the same thing of like getting fangs in the neck. I can feel it for some reason. And then my right. chest always has a little bit of like, <laughs> yeah. whenever Ooh. I see it, it, I mean, in comic books in you know, TV or movies or something, whatever it is, it's just like, Ooh, ah, yeah. ah, my rib cage. That, yeah. doesn't, that doesn't look pleasant. I mean, he said of Batman basically saved I mean, save the day. And I like how they wrap it up, but it's not just like, all right, we're done. But kind of is, but it works totally of you. I mean, you already said about. By the way, Superman, I get those scratches cleaned if I were you with holy water, um, if you can get it right. Um, I like Superman's complete like I owe you my life. Yes, I suppose you do. Now, looking <laughs> up on that on that DC fandom site. It had said, and because you've read all of these, where this was early enough to where that site had said Batman didn't know that Superman was Clark Kent. Yeah, that was legit. So the the phone call. So Batman really thinks he's calling Clark Kent because Clark Kent has an association with Superman and Clark Kent would be the guy to give Superman the heads up that he. He needs some assistance out in Fayetteville. Um, That's real. That that wasn't a that wasn't a um, a, just a clever way of not, you know, exposing themselves potentially to knowing each other's secret identity that had not happened yet. Yeah. Okay. It could work both ways. It could me, um, which it kind of did on first reading. And then when I read that, I was like, Oh, interesting. Um, Cause for some reason I thought that they did reveal each other's identities. And then I'm like, I'm probably getting that mixed up though. Uh, but yeah, I think it could totally work both ways. Um, and it's just in this case, Nope. They don't know who each other is. And I think it's a great to get, you know, that e- equality in here. Uh, we were in Gotham. We haven't been in Gotham yet. We got to go to Metropolis. We haven't been in Gotham. So we end it there in uh, Gotham, which is nice because it brings the whole thing of like, well, Batman's part of like, well, why is he in South Carolina? Right. Yeah, he's tracking murders from things that happened in Gotham. He's on the trail yeah. of what happened in Gotham. So we don't see that the action started in Gotham. We're, we're told that, you know, in a little in a little bit of um, just kind of wordplay, catching the readers up to the story beyond, you know, that happened prior to this actual issue. And then we wrap it up in Gotham um, where they're back investigating those victims that sent Batman on his chase. And in a, in a great way of restraint, but it's like, we don't need to see it to understand the point of how Gordon just says, you know, at least it's ended now. And Batman says, not, not quite one last thing to do before night falls. You and your men are free to leave. If you don't feel like watching it. And it's like, Oh, you know what he's going to do. He's got the stakes <laughs> like, and he's oh got boy. the mallet. And uh, we got to prevent there from being future bat or future vampires that are going to, harass and attack the Gothamites and put Batman in a tough spot. If we've got a plague of vampires unleashed upon the city. Yeah. Dirty Um, work, but somebody has got to do it. And Batman, he will, he will. So I guess it leads now of, do you have anything that we didn't touch on that you'd want to, before I get into some, uh, some favorites, some questions. No, I think the only thing I'd say is, you know, it, it was really interesting to talk about it with you because 
I saw it as a almost M Night Shalomon twist uh, in that but Peter twist. was the vampire. You, you, you read it, you, you saw through it. You were probably the guy that would tell you what happened at the end of. You, you knew what was going on with Bruce Willis from the beginning of the movie. Apparently, I thought it was really interesting on the first reading that I was surprised. In the second reading, the clues are there, and it was really fun to read the second time knowing that that twist was coming and looking out for, oh, I wonder if Byrne dropped some hints along the way. And he sure did. So, um, you know, (laughs) spoiler alert, if you haven't read this episode before (laughs) listening to this podcast, maybe maybe you should have done that. But I think it would be super enjoyable for you either way. No, I think it kind of, as I said, it didn't have, I did not have it figured out. I just had like um, some questions ready at the at the beginning but i think it's structured really really well that um there's even there's a big benefit in revisiting it absolutely because i didn't have all the pieces uh fitting together there are a few i'm like huh interesting and then talking about with you even the last lingering ones kind of snapped together so um yeah i think it's a i mean as you kind of said a well-constructed issue that um stands tall holds up so let me ask you then that said garrett Yes. yes, you've got a question? Yes. What's your favorite part of Skater? I think my favorite part is in the well, this is a big this is a big chunk and I already talked about it. So maybe this is too big to be considered a part, but I think once Superman arrives and you get, you know, probably 6 pages worth of, you know, a couple Superman pages and how the story unfolds and then we flip over to Batman and how the story unfolds, that back and forth felt really nice. I thought it was a good introduction. You know, the action and climax and wrap up is good, too. But I thought that middle chunk of the story where you get both characters point of view as the reader to say, like, oh, what the heck is going on? Um, You know, I'd say that's more of a segment than a part, but I really enjoyed that segment. I thought it was a super fun way to continue, you know, moving the storyline forward while giving us time with each of our two favorite characters, my two favorite characters. And mine would be when uh, Ellie Mae takes bruce to the cabin right because that's where stuff really escalates um and batman gets he gets some answers but is still kind of uh surprised by it and i mean it creates some you know some good drama there as well because it's not like batman knows what's going on and then uh a revelation comes out and he instantly just like okay well i'll solve this punch to the face and you're done it's like no he gets himself in some trouble and everything so um yeah, I think that's my favorite part. What about your favorite panel? You know, I've got a couple, but okay. <laughs> I'm going to go with this one just because it's the Batman book club. And uh, so Batman should be the focal point. I feel like is only fair. You mentioned how cool that uh, the uh, Skeeter, you know, in shadow starting to go in full vampire mode with Superman in the panel was. Yeah. But I really think the the last panel of the story you get Batman from the waist to the knees, his hands holding the stakes, his other hand holding the the mallet. Gordon in the background looking a little bit shocked or, um, I don't know, maybe even disgusted or concerned with what Batman's going to have to do. And then the officer in silhouette behind that. Um, I just thought that was a great bit of storytelling through the art. The focus is on you know, the, the grisly tools for this grisly job. It's not a full yeah. big picture of Batman because Batman's not the focus. The task Batman has to complete to keep Gotham safe is. I just, I thought that was really well drawn and a, and a smart choice on part of Adams. Well done. Uh, I had similar issues as you did. I really like that. I don't know what page um, very early on. It's like page four when we see her arrive at her cabin. Because that evokes old school horror comics of like Tales from the Crypt or Creepy or something, which is really cool. But I also feel like, too, like, eh, I know that I always emphasize if I see an image and I can create a story behind it, something like that. um, Those usually win it for me. And I can with that. But yeah, her running through the reeds with the mob behind them and the the flaming torches. All cool stuff. Yeah, very cool. But it's the Batman book club. So it's Batman impaling the vampire. Yeah, the first the first panel where he his face is like, you know, covered in shadow and stuff. I think that's very cool. You see that one on its own. It's like, whoa, Batman staking a vampire with a Mr. Peanut T-shirt. What is going on? (laughs) Clearly, this is in the 80s because look at that hair. Um, Absolutely. There's a lot of moose in that hair. (laughs) Yeah. 
Um, it, if you need a teased image, although it's kind of a uh, spoilerish, it's like, that's your image for this, this issue. Be good uh, would you like to see this animated? In Absolutely. A, Heck yeah. It'd film? be great. Okay. You know, think about it as like a, you know, if you get 90 minutes, uh, even though they like to do like 86 minutes on the animated movies, but if there could be like a little horror anthology movie that was released, I don't think it needs to be a whole movie itself. But if you did like three 22 minute segments, I'd love for this one to be one of the 22. Man, look at that Midwest brain. Cause that's exactly what I was going to say is how DC always does every year. Um, like this year, even at the beginning of the month, they did like the, I'm trying to think. But they, they almost do like anthology comics, like oversized ones, like 60 right. to 80 pages. And it's just short stories of heroes with like this time of year, Halloween or horror influenced. And uh, I'm looking it up right now because I'm going to smack myself. Ghoul, this year it's DC's Ghouls Just Want to Have Fun. That's like their horror themed anthology book. But um, do something like that for a movie. Absolutely. Yeah. And this would be, be awesome. Great. This can be your main one even like the yeah, Constantine dude, this movie like they did was a little bit longer beginning of this year the Constantine house of mystery or whatever it was like it was a Constantine one that was 25 30 minutes and then they did shorts from the other movies for like That'd the next great. 40 minutes like yeah there you go it's right there practically writes itself uh Garrett what's your final thoughts on because I just want to say it one more time skater I think it's <laughs> I think obviously I enjoy it I think I think it's well constructed I think the arts you know really really well done um, a little bit of a different flavor, but still very familiar. You get uh, two of my favorite characters of all times, you know, rocking out with the supernatural and that's tough to beat. So don't <laughs> miss it. Check it out. You can find it a few different places. You might have to work, but it's available online or go get this trade What's and probably get it on a discount right now. Yeah. You can buy used copies of stuff and it becomes very affordable also. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's where I stand, too. I'm glad he chose this one. It was a great little great little story for me. I'll visit it again this time of year next year, um, only adding to my to my uh, holiday based comics. So it's uh, always nice to have some some go to's ready. So when the time of year hits, you know, you're good to go. There's the especially when you're reading longer runs like this, you know, reading these collected editions of the Man of Steel. I found some Superman uh, Christmas stories I can revisit, yeah. you know, when it starts to be that time of year and. Um, it's fun to to kind of have those in your repertoire. And I mean, a good double feature of comic book Halloween reading is uh, this issue and then Lil Gotham, you know, like hand in hand, they perfect mean, yeah. material. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cookies and milk. Actually, cookies and milk, yeah. So um, I want to thank you, my friend, for coming back on, especially for Spooky Month. Uh, time goes by very fast whenever you're on this. Um, and it's always it's always a joy. So please feel free to plug away anything and everything. Well, the pleasure is all over on my end. If uh, if you like listening to me talk and you want to talk with me, whether it's vocally or just with written word, we can do that <laughs> over on X or the Twitter written or, word. <laughs> yeah, whatever the heck we call it these days. You can find me at Garrett Wado. That is at G A R R E T W A T O. Uh, you can find some of the work that I do uh, or have done over at BatmanOnFilm.com. Um, on some podcast episodes over there as well. If you like me talking about stuff and you're like, Hey, I don't care what this guy talks about. I just think it's fun. Uh, you could listen to me talk about fantasy football. I do that. Ooh. Uh, fantasy football podcast with my friend, Matt Renshaw. We are called the dynasty dads. You can find us on Twitter at dynasty dads, all one word. Um, yeah. Otherwise just wait till I should Lauer extends the invite <laughs> to come back. back. And I'll, yeah. if, if, if he wants me, I'll be back. I think we've already we've discussed an idea um, for you that was going to be post spooky month. So hopefully that that carries out and we can make that happen. But as for the Batman Book Club, Twitter and Instagram at the Batman BC, make sure to check that out because there's more spooky month on the way. Uh, good story with our favorite Italian here, Peter Arvera, the frolicker. And then I haven't said it yet, but as soon as it does get finalized, something cool with Justin Kowalski um, should also be coming this month as well as well as another surprise at the end of the month which would be really fun so um yeah check out those follow those because that's where i'll let it be known when that stuff gets uh finalized um if you want to support the show's variety of ways you can do that like i said at the top patreon.com slash the batman bc also tpublic.com type in tbbc for the batman book club uh, but if you want to support the show and you don't want to spend any money at all it's 100 a-okay the easiest quickest the most impactful thing you can do 
is rate and review the show. So wherever you listen to it on podcasts of Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, iHeartRadio, just go to the rate and review page and rate and review the show. Because the more reviews the show gets, the more it helps spread the word. And as we all around these here parts know, the word is panic. So for Garrett and all of the residents of Fayetteville, South Carolina, um, I'm Ryan Lauer. And until next time, eat some more Halloween candy. And we will back.